Hey guys, I'm Georgia and welcome back for another unsolved case. Today I want to share with you the details of yet another unidentified serial killer. This time it's the New Bedford Highway Killer who is suspected of the deaths of at least nine women plus the disappearances and suspected murders of two others, all in New Bedford, Massachusetts. That's 11 potential victims, maybe even more, all of whom disappeared from New Bedford between March and September 1988. 11 victims in just seven months. And seeing as this is a fairly recent serial killer, these crimes only happened around 34 years ago, there is still every chance this killer is alive and could be captured. It is never too late for justice. Everyone in New Bedford has a different theory as to who could be the one responsible for these murders, or whether we're potentially looking at even more than one person. But without more eyes being on this case, on the stories of these young women who tragically lost their lives, justice will never come. And as always, before I get into the bulk of this episode, I do just want to give a quick shout out to my main source that I used to write this script, which this time is the book Shallow Graves by Maureen Boyle. Now this case isn't one that's been covered extensively or spoken about in the media really, so legitimate sources have been really hard to come by and Maureen's book has been such a rich and informative read. She focuses in on the victims as people, them and their lives and their families, Whilst also talking about the details of the investigation itself, I really highly, highly recommend picking up this book for yourself if you want to really deep dive into this case. So this is New Bedford, located in Bristol County, Massachusetts. It grew originally many years ago as one of the world's most important whaling ports. It was actually at one time in the early 19th century, the wealthiest city in the whole world because of this whaling. And it's also where Moby Dick is set. And whilst the city doesn't still hold this huge accolade today, New Bedford is still America's number one fishing port, earning its living from the sea that it sits on. Obviously, I've never been to New Bedford, but from the photos I've seen online, it looks like a really beautiful place. But the city hides the dark secret of the New Bedford Highway Killer. In 1990, the city had a population of just under 100,000 people, and around this time it was a place full of working class families who rarely tended to move away from this area. And as with any other city, it had the areas of higher poverty where people struggled more to make ends meet, and therefore you'd find a lot of drug use and crime. New Bedford had a whole underworld of heroin addiction and almost the entirety of crime in the city was tied to the drug trade, so this was a big thing here. But in 1988, it just wasn't really something you'd talk about. If you were struggling with drug addiction or substance abuse, there are very few places you could turn. There were fewer sympathetic people to talk to, and so if you were and are in the midst of addiction issues, you'd mostly turn to the streets to make money to fund your habits, whether that was in the form of shoplifting, or writing bad checks, or just turning to sex work. And that's the life that all of the women who had fall victim to this serial killer had found themselves trapped in. All of them were either drug addicts or sex workers or both. And as you see happens time and time again in cases of disappearances of sex workers or just disappearances of women on the outside of society in general, it took way too long for anyone to notice a pattern in what was going on. No one noticed women were going missing for far too long. It wasn't until the disappearance of Nancy Paver in July 1988 that the authorities started to take any notice. Nancy is now listed as number seven on the official list of victims, with six others disappearing in the three months before she did. But it was only with Nancy that ears were pricked. Nancy was a 36-year-old mother of two whose life had taken a bit of a turn after her divorce. Her parents died, she had another long-term relationship that came to an end, she struggled to find a well-paying job to fund her life and her children's lives, and it was just a series of unfortunate events, and slowly Nancy's life fell into something that she just no longer recognised. She met the wrong man who convinced her to try drugs, and from there, everything fell apart. Nancy was said to be a wonderful mother, she loved spending time with her teenage daughters and she would have done anything for them, but the drugs and just substance abuse took over. As far as anyone is aware though, Nancy was not a sex worker. She was last seen on the 7th of July 1988, walking towards home from a bar called Whispers Pub after reportedly having a fight with her boyfriend, Frankie Pina. Their relationship was said to be one of a lot of upset and domestic violence. But it was actually Frankie who reported Nancy as missing 48 hours after she disappeared, despite him being an ex-con who tried to avoid the police at all costs. 
When Nancy didn't come home for two days, he knew that something was up because she hadn't taken her children with her. If she was running away, he knew there was no way she would have left them behind. The man who took the missing persons report from Frankie was Detective John Dexter Durr with the New Bedford Police Department, and for whatever reason, his instinct said to take Frankie seriously. Most other officers just brushed Nancy off as just another junkie who had gone missing, but John Dexter Durr didn't do that. However, there just wasn't enough of a budget within the police department, not enough resources for them to immediately do a full search for Nancy with no obvious signs that she'd been hurt. But then her body would be found a few weeks later on July 30th. A body was found by two men on motorcycles on the westbound side of Interstate 195. It was a miracle these two men had even spotted her body though, it was hidden away quite well and was in a pretty bad state of decomposition thanks to the hot weather of the summer and Nancy was little more than a skeleton when she was found. Because of this, the medical examiner noted that the body had likely been here since springtime, so when investigators were looking through missing persons report from that time to find an ID, they found no matches. As we know, Nancy had only disappeared about three weeks beforehand, which is why they didn't come across her name. She actually remained unidentified for quite a while until dental charts made an identification in October and it was confirmed later in the year that this was correct. But strangely enough, this wasn't the first unidentified body that had been found in this general area in the past month. On the 3rd of July, so just four days before Nancy had gone missing, another body had been found on the northbound side of Route 140, just over the Lakeville boundary line. Interstate 140 runs directly north from New Bedford and the body was found by a woman who had stopped along the side of the road to relieve herself. She spotted it about 30 feet away from the roadside in the brush. This body had also seemed to be female, it was partially dressed with a bra wrapped around the neck. It certainly seemed like somebody had just stopped at the side of the interstate, pulled the body out of the car far enough that it was hidden from view of the road and then they've taken off again. This was clearly a murder, which was later confirmed by the medical examiner, who noted the cause of death as strangulation and the manner of death as a homicide. Only the medical examiner would once again make a mistake and would report that the time of death had been about nine months earlier, anywhere from September to December 1987. This victim was also marked down as a Jane Doe, so by the end of July, New Bedford had two Jane Doe's on their hands. A front page story was run in the local Standard Times in the middle of August asking anyone who hadn't filed a missing persons report for a missing loved one to do so, or to call the police if they had any information as to who these two Jane Doe's could be, but there was no luck. Meanwhile, Detective John Dexter was still paying very close attention to Nancy's case. He watched as missing persons reports came in and noted down other names who seemed to have similar stories to Nancy's. Mary Rose Santos, Sandra Patelho, and Dawn Mendez. These three women would prove to be the last known victims of the New Bedford Highway Killer, but of course John Dexter didn't know that yet. But I think here I'm going to take you back to the very beginning with the very first known victim, Robin Rhodes, also known as Bobby. Very soon into Dexter's sort of solo investigation, he actually noted down Robin as being a possible victim as well, and it seems that he was right. She'd been reported as missing by her mother on July 28th, but it's thought that she had actually been missing as early as March or April of that year. Robin fit the MO exactly. She was 28 years old, she was a known heroin and cocaine addict. She was also linked to many of the other victims, known to be friends with some and acquaintances with others. All of these women tended to run in the same or very similar circles. Robin's body wouldn't be found until potentially a year after her disappearance on the 28th of March 1989. She was found off of Route 140 in Freetown by a search dog. And by this point, one year on from the very first disappearances, law enforcement were actively out there searching for the bodies. They had been for quite a few months. Chronologically, the second woman to disappear was 28-year-old Rochelle Dopirala, a mother of two young children who was known by law enforcement to often hang around Weld Square, which was a place known to be a drug centre of the city. If you wanted drugs, that's where you'd go. And Rochelle was often seen hanging around right there. She disappeared around late April 1988, but her body wouldn't be found till the 10th of December in a gravel pit alongside Reed Road, about two miles off of Interstate 195 to the west of New Bedford. Rochelle was found partially clothed and had been beaten to death. 
Now, Rochelle's case is the only case in which charges were brought against a suspect, a man called Kenneth Ponty, and she actually lived with him at the time of her disappearance. Ponty was arrested for her murder, but the charges were ultimately dropped due to a lack of evidence. However, there is more than enough reason for Kenneth Ponty to be a fantastic suspect in this case, not just for Rochelle's murder, but also for many of the victims. He may well have been the New Bedford Highway killer. He was a lawyer who had links to multiple victims, either through dating them or through representing them in court. I'll delve much more as Kenneth's links to this case later in the episode in like the suspects section once I've outlined all the victims. But also in Rochelle's case, Kenneth wasn't the only interesting name to pop up. It would also turn out that she was last seen alive in the company of Nancy Paver's boyfriend, Frankie Pina. Now he has been cleared in both deaths and he is not viewed as a suspect, but it does go to show how small these circles were in New Bedford at this time. Rochelle had also recently testified against another man in court who she said had raped her, and although police looked into that person, he was also not viewed as a suspect. But Rochelle had a very complicated life, a lot of tangled webs. 25-year-old Deborah McConnell would be the next woman to go missing. She was last seen in May 1988 by her father James at Rhode Island Cemetery. They had literally just buried her mother. James said that on this date, Deborah was really hyper and he became very concerned about her well-being when she failed to turn up to her own daughter's 10th birthday party. This was kind of the norm for Deborah. She was very flighty, but it was very strange that she wasn't there. But he wouldn't be super concerned though until bodies started turning up. And when on the 1st of December it was reported that a search dog had found yet another set of remains, he couldn't shake the feeling that it was his daughter. James actually called the state police to ask this question but he just got brushed off and New Bedford police were too busy to talk to him. It would turn out that his gut feeling was absolutely correct. It was Deborah's body that had been found that day with a bra wrapped around her neck but she would remain a Jane Doe for quite a while until her identity was discovered. The next woman to disappear was 29-year-old Deborah Medeiros. Now the timeline is a bit iffy here, she might have disappeared before Deborah McConnell or maybe slightly after, but Deborah was known to have a long-standing substance abuse issue. She'd been in jail in the past, she spent a long time in and out of rehab programs. It had been a really long-standing battle for her and she'd really fought against her issues. It's thought the last time Deborah was seen was around April 1988 when she had an argument with her boyfriend at their home in New Bedford and she just stormed out and never came home. She wouldn't be reported as missing by her mother until one month later, hence the slight confusion in the timeline there. In the December, Deborah would be identified as the Jane Doe we spoke about earlier in the episode, the first body found on the 3rd of July. It would later come out that Deborah had actually been an informant for a detective in local Freetown called Alan Alves, and there is question over whether her death could be linked to that, perhaps somebody found out what she was doing and she got killed, but nothing has ever been confirmed. Also, Deborah's boyfriend was never considered a suspect. Once again, Deborah was found with her bra wrapped around her neck and she was partially dressed. And to share a small silver lining in such a dark story, after Deborah's death, her mother would go on to become a counsellor for drug and alcohol addicts in honour of her daughter, and I'm sure her mother saved many lives through that work. Christina Montero was 19 years old when she was last seen in April 1988. Her case was actually said to be very similar to that of the first victims, Robin. She also had a young child and she was addicted to heroin and cocaine and the two lived relatively close to each other as well. They were also very close to their families and they regularly checked in with them and that's how Christina's family knew that something bad had happened. She seemed to just disappear off the grid. But unlike in Robin's case, Christina has never been found. Christina was a black female with brown hair and brown eyes and she had scars on both wrists as well as a scar near her left eye. She was 5 foot 3 to 5 foot 5 and weighed 110 pounds. At the time of her disappearance she was wearing a shirt, blue jeans and trainers or I probably should say sneakers and it was noted that she would have had needle marks in both arms. She also had initials and words tattooed on her arms. Whilst Christina is very much believed to be a victim of the New Bedford Highway Killer, there's no confirmation of that until her body is found. Chances are she is also hidden on the side of a major road running out of New Bedford. Despite extensive searches though, she has never been found. 
The body of the next suspected victim, Marilyn Cardoza Roberts, has also never been found. Marilyn was 34 years old when she was last seen in the April of 1988, and she started her battle with substance abuse in her mid-twenties when she met the wrong man. But she fought and eventually seemed to win over her demons. She settled down and married somebody else. She had her own home, she was very house proud, she had a good marriage, she was very much on the right track in life before she met another man who was also in the drug world and all her years of effort fell away. Marilyn's family did what they could to help her but sadly there's only so much that can be done in situations like this. One day she had an argument with her parents and stormed out of the house never to be seen again. She missed her mother's birthday and mother's day and her family became increasingly worried for her welfare. Her family did originally believe that she had moved to the West Coast to go and live with a relative, but they later learned that this definitely wasn't the case, she'd never moved away. She was reported as missing fairly soon after she disappeared, but in the June it was thought there'd been a sighting of her in New Bedford, and her family were very relieved to know she was safe. Only in December 1988, they still hadn't seen her for themselves, and they heard about the potential serial killer in the area, so they reported Marilyn was missing for a second time. As I said, Marilyn's body has never been found. She was white, 5 foot 4 and 110 to 120 pounds. She had brown hair and brown eyes and had tattoos and needle marks on both arms. She was last seen wearing a t-shirt, blue jeans and sneakers, very very similar to what Christina was wearing actually. Another later victim, Sandy Botelho, did say at the time that Marilyn stole $25,000 worth of jewellery off her boyfriend as she fled, but there's never been any evidence to back this up and she's never been found. In July 1988, our third Deborah, Deborah Greenwald de Mello, a 35-year-old mother of three, went missing. She had substance abuse issues and her body was found four months later in November by a prison work crew beside Interstate 195. She was found just off of the eastbound ramp leading to Reed Road, which is the same road off of which Rochelle's body would also be found just one month later. Her body was found alongside some belongings of Nancy Paver, which kind of solidified once and for all that all of these cases were linked. It was just too much of a coincidence to think anything otherwise. Why else would Deborah have Nancy's belongings with her? Mary Santos was 26 years old when she disappeared in July 1988. She was last seen on July 16th when her husband dropped her off at the bus station and then she was seen dancing at the old horseback lounge which is a bar a few hours later. Mary loved to dance and she told her husband that she was going for a night out with her girls and she had enough change in her pocket to call him from a payphone when she wanted a lift home, only she never called. Her friends would later say that she did cocaine that night at a friend's apartment before telling them that she was going out to work and they all knew what she meant when she said that. Turns out that Mary had taken up sex work on the side to relieve bill pressure to help the household out. Her husband had no idea but Mary just wanted to do her part and it was easy money. People who knew Mary on the streets would say that she was just a bit too soft for the job. She was very naive and always thought the best of everyone. So she would often find herself in sticky situations because of this, but she clearly wasn't deterred. At some point that night, Mary met the wrong person and by 5.30am when her husband still hadn't heard from her, he put their sons in the car and started to drive around in search. Soon he reported her as missing. Her body would be found by two boys in March 1989 along Route 88. She was actually found a little bit further out than the rest of the bodies had been, but Mary had disappeared from New Bedford just like the rest, and therefore her case was undeniably linked. On August 11th, 1988, 25-year-old Sandra Patelho, known as Sandy, went missing. Sandy had a long-term cocaine addiction and worked the streets to fund it. She had a long list of clients who would often return to her. Just like Mary, Sandy was described as trusting and she'd often get ripped off by clients on the streets. On the night of her disappearance, Sandy called up the stairs to her boyfriend of 13 years to let him know that she is going to a friend's house just a few doors down to get some bread and she would be right back. But she never came home and it was later confirmed that she never even arrived at her friend's house. At some point in those mere metres between the homes, something had happened to her. Sandy's body would be the last body that would be found in the woods alongside Interstate 195 in late April 1989. She was found nude and folded into the fetal position. The final victim to disappear was 25-year-old Dawn Mendez. 
she had a fairly extensive history of drugs and sex work and she'd actually lost custody of her five-year-old son because of this, who was being raised by her mother. On the day of her disappearance, the 4th September 1988, Dawn was meant to be attending a family christening and nobody had any doubts that she was going to show up. Although Dawn very much struggled with substance abuse, she was determined to have any contact with her son that she could and her son was due to be at this party so she wouldn't have missed it. And usually, even if her plans did change, Dawn would call her family to let them know. But that day, Dawn never arrived at the party and her mum reported her as missing soon after, knowing that something had to be terribly wrong. Her body would be found on November 29th, once again on the Reed Road ramp just off of Interstate 195, as she was found just a couple of weeks after Deborah DeMello's body had been found very, very nearby. And then, after Dawn's disappearance, the murders just seemed to stop for whatever reason. But even by that point, so we're on the 4th of September and there's 11 missing women, law enforcement still hadn't put all the pieces or the puzzle together. Even John Dexter's potential list of victims at this point had only reached four names, but he did suspect more and it did slowly grow. By the end of October, the list was six names. And by this point, three bodies had all been found within a 20 minute drive of New Bedford. So it was very clear that some proper searching needs to be done, this time with a search dog. And it's at this point the investigation does start to ramp up. This is when the true extent of this serial killer's crime started to be uncovered and the investigation really kicked up a notch. Investigators were assigned to the case, word was spread, witnesses were searched for, evidence was examined, a hotline was set up for public tips. They even worked very closely with sex workers, bringing them in to look at suspects, asking them for updates, rumours, whatever was swirling the streets. Any potential suspect was examined until they could be removed from the list. And soon the district attorney got involved, expecting regular updates on the case. The DA wanted to make a prosecution in this case, he wanted to find out who was responsible and he wanted to publicly punish them. But whereas often in cases such as this there won't be any suspects, the opposite was true this time. There were so many suspects, there were so many people that could potentially be involved in something like this. The FBI were pulled in and they did a profile of the potential killer and they found the killer to be organised. So somebody who goes to great lengths to cover their tracks, the crimes are premeditated and carefully planned. Historically, organised killers have proven to be of average to above average intelligence. They're attractive, married or in a long term relationship, employed, educated and charming. They wouldn't be seen on the outside to be a killer. Further profiling told investigators to look very closely at individuals in law enforcement, truckers and drug dealers. So basically either people who had close access to the victims or easy access to transport. So let's look at a few of these suspects, starting with a man I've already mentioned in this video, Kenneth Ponty. Kenneth Ponty had a bit of a reputation around New Bedford. He was a lawyer, but had also donated some money to the Bristol County Sheriff's election campaign, and he was sworn in as a deputy sheriff on the back of this. This was meant to be kind of like an honorary title, but it did actually give Kenneth the ability to serve court papers, and it gave him a badge and a gun that he was known to abuse. There were many rumours and reports that Kenneth would regularly flash his badge to drug dealers and get them to hand over their drugs to him but he'd never hand these drugs to the correct places. Ponty was known to be a reformed heroin addict who went to law school after kicking his heroin habit, but he was never quite able to stop cocaine. Once he passed the bar, he would very much focus on lower level criminal cases, and he was known around town as generally just being a bit weird. He would often host these big parties at his home where he would invite sex workers just to do drugs and he was also said to be a very paranoid man but apparently he was never actually violent. Let's just say he's not the kind of guy you'd really want to be a lawyer nor is he the kind of guy you'd want holding a police badge and a gun. Ponty's name first came up in connection with this case in the disappearance of Rochelle Dopiorala, who'd been staying at his house at the time she went missing, and he was described as her boyfriend. They'd definitely been seen walking around town holding hands. But it would turn out that Rochelle wouldn't be his only connection to the serial killer victims. It would turn out that he'd represented Mary Santos in a civil case before, and when she went missing, he actually helped her husband make and put up missing person posters. Dawn Mendez had been seen before banging on the front door of his home, seemingly desperate to get in. Robin Rose, the first victim, had once told her sister that she was dating a lawyer. 
this lawyer would turn out to be Kenneth. Nancy Paper once worked at a video rental store that Kenneth was known to frequent, and she would later hire him in a bankruptcy case. Maybe this was just the world that Kenneth ran in, he was a lawyer in these kind of low level cases the women would find themselves stuck with, but that's a lot of links to a lot of victims. It is all circumstantial though. What is more interesting is that one month after Dawn Mendez, the last victim, went missing, Kenneth Ponty moved away from New Bedford, heading to Florida. Is it a coincidence that the murders stopped so soon after he moved? Well, maybe it is, or maybe not. Investigators actually weren't convinced about him as a suspect at first, but a search dog was actually brought into his old office to have a sniff around just to see if there was anything there, but it didn't alert to anything at all. For a couple of years, Ponty's name would float around as a suspect, but nothing would be done about it until August 1990, when he was indicted by a grand jury in the murder of Rochelle de Pierala. Now, this whole story begins back in April 1908, when these murders first started happening, when he represented Rochelle in a rape case she was making against another man. Ponty would be accused of pulling a gun on the guy that Rochelle was making the claims against, and he would end up being charged with assault with a deadly weapon. In early 1989, a grand jury indicted him on these old charges, and he was arraigned. The case was moved to a higher court, and this gave the district attorney an excuse to get hair and saliva samples off of him, and Ponty was quite cooperative with this. He happily gave up his hair and saliva, but for some reason he refused to let police take a photo of a tattoo that he had on his arm. Ponty's lawyer was actually able to convince the judge to impound all of these samples, and this meant the investigators in the serial killer case couldn't get their hands on them to compare to anything. But like I said, it wasn't until 1990 that he was indicted for the murder. The DA had spent a really, really long time compiling a report of all the indictable offences to Ponty, and now it was all sort of coming to a head. In April 1990, he was indicted on drug charges and appeared at New Bedford Superior Court for his arraignment on the 13th. He entered a not guilty plea before leaving, but just 10 minutes later, he was handed a subpoena to appear before a grand jury who were investigating the highway killings. By the August of that year, the grand jury had sat and listened to testimony from a lot of people in relation to these murders. They would heard statements from multiple people, all pointing the finger in different directions at different people. But then, a woman called Diane Doherty came to the picture, and Diane had previously said that Ponty had confessed to her about being guilty for six of the highway murders. However, Diane was a very difficult woman to pin down. She could never stay on track while she was telling a story. She'd be all over the place all of the time. She'd change her story constantly. She threw a lot of suspicion on Ponty. She was speaking of drugs and dark porn videos being made using the sex workers of New Bedford. She said that in Florida, Ponty had three cats, Rochelle, Robin and Nancy, three of the victims. She said that he tried to choke her at one point. She said that Ponty told her that Rochelle died because she was going to testify against him in court. In all honesty, Diane was a bit of a mess of a witness, she wasn't exactly credible, but regardless, it was all fuel for the DA's office against Kenneth Ponty. But there was only actual potential evidence against him in the case of Rochelle. Now, we know that she was living with him, and we know that she was set to testify against him in an upcoming case. We know that Kenneth drove her around often, we know that one witness overheard Kenneth threaten Rochelle in April 1988. We know that she wasn't seen alive after April 1988. And then you have Diane Doherty claiming that Kenneth confessed to her, and she even said that he had a snuff film of Rochelle's death. And so, on August 17th, he was arraigned on one single count of murder. But this would be dropped one year later, in July 1991, by a new DA, because there just wasn't enough evidence against him. And honestly, that does make sense. This was clearly a man who had a lot of connections to this case. I understand why he was looked at so closely as a suspect. I also understand they simply didn't have enough evidence to charge him with anything. He may have been a bad man, he may have been a troubled man, but does that make him a murderer, or actually no, a serial killer? There's nothing to actually suggest that. It was after this point that the case started to go really cold, the DA never quite chased any suspect up like they had for Kenneth Ponty. 
But Kenneth Ponty is not the only suspect in this case, he is just one of many. And the next name that was on the tip of everyone in New Bedford's tongue at this time was that of Anthony de Gracia. Sex workers in New Bedford would often talk about a guy who circled the city in a pickup truck who looked like a boxer with a flat nose. This man would apparently seem very normal and very harmless at first before suddenly attacking, reaching for the women's throats, choking them, raping them. And the news of this got back to investigators. The name was Anthony de Grazia. By the age of 20, de Grazia had been arrested in a rape case for which he was found not guilty. But then throughout the 80s, these rumours would continue to follow him. He was violent and angry and all the sex workers knew to avoid him like the plague. But you would always get girls who would go with him, they needed the money. He was an obvious suspect when the serial killings began and soon after, one sex worker identified him as the man in question. So New Bedford detectives turned up at his front door with a search warrant and they found some very concerning things in his blackboard pickup truck. They found multiple knives, a human fingernail, blood in the interior air vents, they found footprints on the passenger side ceiling. It was a very unusual scene to say the least. At the same time as this, de Grazia had been brought into the station for questioning where he denied having anything to do with not just the murders but also multiple allegations of rape and sexual assault that he'd been accused of. In the end, de Grazia was formally charged with 17 attempted rapes and assaults but he was never charged with anything relating directly to the murders. Whilst awaiting his trial in county jail, he made multiple threats against the district attorney, threatened to murder him, and although he was briefly released on bail, he was quickly rearrested because officials were worried the threats were serious, but he was eventually released again. In May 1989, de Grazia was ordered to provide blood samples to prosecutors, and that sample was later sent to the FBI to compare against the blood found in his car. If this was a match, this blood was clearly nothing to worry about, it was just his blood. And although it doesn't seem like the results of this testing were ever made public, he was never charged with anything on the back of this, so that might say all we need to know, that blood probably was actually his. In the middle of 1990, de Grazia was released from prison, and just one month later, in July 1990, he was found dead at his ex-girlfriend's parents' house in Freetown. Now, the Freetown police ruled his death a homicide, however, the district attorney later ruled it a suicide, something the autopsy report does not seem to agree with. It certainly seems like something fishy was going on there. And interestingly, de Grazia's death did come very soon after Kenneth Ponty was released as number one suspect, a spot which de Grazia probably knew that he was about to take over. Was his death an admission of his guilt? It certainly seems like the authorities thought so and they said so much in a public broadcast, although they did later attract that. The fact remains though that there has never been any actual evidence found to link de Grazia to the 17 rapes he was accused of, nor to the unsolved serial murders, but you can see why he was looked at as a potential suspect. Kenneth Ponty and Anthony de Gracia were without a doubt the two main suspects in this case at the time. Investigators had many more people they looked into but nothing ever quite stuck. Around 2007 I think there was Daniel Tavares Jr who came into spotlight when he was in prison for the murder of his own mother and he sent a letter to prison staff claiming responsibility for the highway murders. He lived in New Bedford at the time and he said he had knowledge of where another victim, Gail Botelho, had been buried. And turns out he was right. She was buried exactly where he said, under a tree in his own backyard. And Tavares was convicted of her murder in 2015. But was Gail a victim of the New Bedford Highway Killer? The MO didn't really match, purely because she wasn't dumped by a major road, although it is thought that she did have a cocaine addiction. I don't think anyone ever really took Daniel Tavares as a serious suspect in this case though. The final theory I want to mention today isn't so much a potential suspect but perhaps just a linked case and that's the Lisbon Ripper. Now I don't actually know if I've mentioned up to this point in the video but New Bedford actually has a really high Portuguese population. I think at the time of this case the population in New Bedford was one third Portuguese and obviously Lisbon is the capital of Portugal. In 1992 and 1993 in Lisbon, three sex workers were brutally murdered in the city by a still unknown serial killer dubbed the Lisbon Ripper. Two other sex workers were also found murdered but under different conditions. 
In March 1993, two detectives from Lisbon actually travelled to New Bedford to investigate the similarities in the cases, whilst at the same time two FBI officers headed to Lisbon. Could this have been the work of a Portuguese person committing crimes on both sides of the ocean? It is thought the Lisbon Ripper certainly did travel as they had also been linked to other cases throughout Europe, with beliefs that they may have been a long-haul truck driver, but you can't drive a truck over the Atlantic. This theory was further cemented in 2011 when a 21 year old man named Joel applied for a Portuguese show in which participants tried to guess each other's secrets. Joel's secret was that his father, José Pedro Guedes, was the Lisbon Ripper and Guedes was actually arrested for the crimes on the back of this. But apparently in Portugal, the statute of limitations of murder is actually only 15 years and the 15 years since 1993 was up, he couldn't be prosecuted. It's not known if Guedes was ever in the USA or specifically in New Bedford. If you ask me, I don't think there's really anything to link these cases other than a loose Portuguese connection and the fact that victims were sex workers. But sadly, sex workers are fairly usual victims in serial killing cases. They're easy targets, they're vulnerable women. I mention this theory purely because everywhere else on the internet does, but I don't really think there's much to it. I'm not an investigator though, so who knows? Although the vast majority of victims in the New Bedford Highway Killer case were way too decomposed to tell the cause of death, what we can tell from a couple of the bodies is the cause of death was strangulation. We don't know if it was all, but in a couple we know that. And the Lisbon Ripper didn't have that same MO. All of which brings us to today. What is the most up-to-date news in this case? Well, nothing much has really happened in many years, but in February 2021, a spokesperson for the Bristol County District Attorney did release the following statement. We are utilising the most up-to-date technology in this case and several other cold cases from previous administrations. We have completed DNA testing in the case, which remains active and ongoing. We continue to pursue all leads and follow up on tips regularly. Our office's cold case unit has been publicly highlighting unsolved homicides from previous administrations dating back several decades and we will continue to do so. So it does certainly seem like they are still following up on any new leads that come in. They're focusing in on DNA technology, which does seem to be the best thing to do in cases like this one. We're going to be seeing a lot of old cold cases getting solved over the next couple of years, thanks to DNA tech and genealogical databases. In writing the book Shallow Graves, Maureen Boyle said that she hoped it would renew interest in this case and hopefully lead to helpful new tips. I would say it certainly has renewed interest. Had she not written this book, I doubt I ever would have come across this case to cover on my own channel and here we are getting the word out even more. It is all about cases like this, getting the word out there as far as possible. Sometimes all you need is for the right one person to hear a story and have it spark a memory. Perhaps someone who was too scared to speak out all those years ago but is now in a much safer place to do so. The victims' families are still very much fighting in this case, still looking for clues and refuse to give up on their loved ones. They deserve justice, especially after so many years. Anyone with any information about the murders or the missing women are asked to contact the Bristol County District Attorney's Office. I will leave the relevant contact details in the description box down below. Thank you so much for tuning in today. If you live around New Bedford, please do not hesitate to share this video, share this story with anyone who will listen. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.